Pastor Ruth Cutler. St. Peter's Lutheran Church of rural Audubon. And usually on Good Friday, uh, some of our churches come together and have a worship service in the evening. Of course, we're not able to do that this year, but we, we do get to worship together just from our own homes. Some of the local pastors and I, we wanted to put together this worship experience for you. And so uh, four different pastors, we've each shared um, a video, and we've put all those videos together, focusing on the seven last words of Christ. Pastors sharing devotions tonight. In addition to me are Pastor Dean Greer from First Lutheran and Audubon, Pastor Roy Noel from the Lakes Area Ministry Partners, Exho and Augustana, and Pastor Rod Speedall from Lake Park Lutheran Church in Lake Park. So by all accounts, Jesus didn't do a lot of talking on the cross. It was as if he was alone in his pain, silent for many hours that he hung there, except for a very few words. And the first word that we remember him saying was, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. The events of Good Friday are well underway now, set in motion by many events, and one in particular, a kiss. Judas Iscariot, a man remembered for one thing, a kiss that betrayed his Lord and his friend. There aren't many references to Judas in the New Testament, and almost all of them refer to Judas as the, tr the traitor or the betrayer of Jesus. In fact, the name itself, Judas, has come to mean traitor to us. But the name Judas wasn't always that way. It's the Greek form of the name Judah that means praise. He was chosen by Jesus to be a disciple. Judas was called friend by Jesus. And it was a word that indicated partnership and camaraderie and companionship. In scripture, it says that Judas had stolen from the money box but the other 11 apostles had sins recorded too. Unbelief, lust for power and, pa and position, not being mindful of things of the Spirit. But Judas, we remember, for that kiss, that kiss that marked him forever as the betrayer, the traitor. And who knows exactly why Judas did what he did? History has reported his reasoning being many different reasons. Some say it was greed, although the money, it wasn't a great amount. Some say he disagreed with the way that Jesus was doing things. Some say it was all part of God's plan. And many are quick to put Judas's sin on a whole other level than the sins we commit every day. But the fact is that Judas was just the first in a procession of betrayers 2,000 years long. If Jesus were to exclude him from his love and forgiveness to one degree or another, he would have to exclude all of humankind. I think of that moment in the garden when Judas approached Jesus to betray him. Two friends, two old friends, two people who had traveled a long journey together shared bread together. And even though Jesus knew who would betray him, he called Judas friend. Even in that last moment, they were together. When I think of that moment, that kiss, it isn't just that the events are being set in motion for the crucifixion that strikes me. It is thinking of these people, these two people, two friends with a shared history, and knowing it would never be the same again. Anyone who has ever been betrayed by a friend, by a loved one, can understand the human emotions here of pain and confusion and disbelief that come when someone dear turns out to be someone who causes pain. 
in a way I can't help but think that that kiss was one of the most painful blows that Jesus would receive over the course of the next hours. The last touch he received from a friend. After the last meal he shared with his friends. The touch of betrayal. And yet now it is Judas that Jesus is prepared to go out and die for. Judas and people a lot like Judas. You and me. You see that's what Good Friday is all about. This amazing love. It's a love that's all about forgiving. Even people like Judas and Herod and Pilate and you and me. It's crazy love. It doesn't make any sense. But it's a love that keeps on loving. We can't comprehend it. But if we are wise, we embrace it. And we give great thanks for it. And it is summed up pretty well in Jesus' first words from the cross. Words he cries out on behalf of every one of us. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The second word of Jesus from the cross. One of the criminals hanging alongside him cursed him. Some Messiah you are. Save yourself. Save us. But the other one made him shut up. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Jesus said, don't worry, I will. Today you will be with me in paradise. We have three people hanging on a cross in this image. In this picture, we have two criminals each on the either side of Jesus, they have two very different attitudes, and in the center of it all, we have Jesus. All three are being hung as criminals in the Roman Empire, in the kingdom of people, and there is mention of the kingdom of Jesus. The first criminal has taken his suffering and his circumstances and we might say rightly so, turned inward and turned it into anger and resentment and irritability. And he's taking this out on the people next to him. I think we can understand what that's like. When our circumstances get challenging, when we enter into a place of suffering, whether that is physical or mental or spiritual or financial, no matter what that source of suffering is, we can often turn inwards and get consumed by the anger and the resentment and the irritability. And we can let it spill over onto the people next to us. The second criminal has a very different response, and it is a better example for us. He simply looks to Jesus. He's going through the same suffering, the same experience as Jesus and the other criminal, and his response is to look to Jesus. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He understands that's a very different kingdom than the kingdom of people. Jesus brought that kingdom into the world that people might understand what the kingdom of God looks like. That they might understand in human flesh what God's love and forgiveness looks like, even to death on a cross. He says, remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. Now, I know some of us joke with each other. We say, when you get big and famous, don't forget about us little guys. The second criminal understands that Jesus is a big deal. That his kingdom that he is about to come into is that peaceful kingdom of God. Jesus simply responds, I will. I would encourage you this week as you step into your circumstances, whatever they might be, that you would avoid what the first criminal did. Avoid turning inside with anger and bitterness and resentment and irritability. And choose what the second criminal chose. Turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, remember me. And his answer will continue to be, I will.
Christ peace be with you on this Good Friday. Uh, we are talking about Jesus' seven last words from the cross, and the one I wish to talk with you about today is this from the Gospel of John. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After seeing that his mother was going to be cared for shortly after that, Jesus passed on. And I think it's important for us to, to think about what he did uh, as he was dying on the cross. You could easily imagine that he'd be so consumed with the, with the pain, the terrible pain he was suffering, uh, for our sake, suffering innocently, that he would have his mind on a million other things uh, other than uh, these earthly relationships. But no, he wanted to do, make sure that his mother was cared for. With his last dying breath, Jesus saw to it that his mother would be cared for. He called to his disciple that he loved, John, and asked him to care for his mother. And so it gives us an idea into Christ's uh, compassion and loving heart, right? That even as he faced death on the cross, he wanted to see that those he loved were cared for and were caring for each other. And so we go forward into our lives as Christians uh, with a similar sort of perspective. We're here on earth to do uh, two things, to glorify God and to love one another. And Jesus did all of that and more, of course, on the cross. And so this, um, as we prepare to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, know this, that you are loved and your relationships to one another are important to God Almighty. And he wants it. He wants us to follow in the footsteps of his son, Jesus Christ, that we love and care for one another. These are important things. A spiritual life is a life centered on loving and caring for your neighbor. Amen. The last words of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From Matthew's Gospel. Um, there are two ways that Christians usually interpret Christ's cry from the cross. The one that's most obvious, I guess, is that he was authentically crying out in despair at being abandoned by the Father because he had become sin, um, according to Paul, uh, Paul's uh, reference in Corinthians, um, that he had become sin. And as sin, God does not tolerate sin, God cannot stand sin, so God then, because Christ took on our sin and became sin, God abandoned him. And it was truly hell then, in that aspect. Um, he was dying on the cross, abandoned by the Father. The spiritual agony was far more uh, uh, desperate than the physical agony that he was suffering. Now, that's, so that's an authentic cry, now, uh, and that certainly could be the case. But if you remember that, to quote one piece of a text for the Jews, of course, and for many Christians, was to call to mind the whole text, you remember that Christ was citing the first line from Psalm 22. And if you read Psalm 22, you realize that it's someone who is in trouble and suffering, you know, the traditional um, person who they say wrote it was David. And uh, it's not ultimately a, a psalm of despair, because when you get to Psalm 24, or when you get to uh, verse 24, it ch entirely changes. It reaffirms the faith that God is not abandoning us. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard me when I cried to him. Jesus is reminding, I believe, those who are to tormenting him on the cross, that God is not a God who abandons his children, and that uh, even as Christ is dying on the cross, seemingly abandoned, uh, it's not the case at all. God is there, and God never abandoned uh, Jesus. And when Jesus died as a, in fulfillment of his mission, Christ or God raised him up. Uh, from the dead. He never abandoned uh, Jesus. It's not that Jesus became sin, but that he became a sin offering. He became a sacrificial lamb. And I would even argue, perhaps, that it's not that he was sacrificing himself to the Father, because the Father loves and forgives without that requirement of sacrifice. The prophets tell us this. But Jesus died to show us that God would not respond in wrath, even as we crucified his only begotten Son. Jesus showed us that God insists on being loving towards us and forgiving towards us, even when we try to kill him. 
Jesus' death on the cross is a sacrifice for sin. And in, in uh, Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. So God was trying to reconcile us to him. And Christ did that by dying on the cross more for us. Uh, I think it's perhaps better to think of Jesus sacrificing himself in the way that someone would sacrifice themselves by running in front of a, a truck to push someone out of the way and then being killed themselves. Jesus died for us to show us that God wants us to be his children and wants us to come home and that he has a place for us in his kingdom. And death won't even keep, uh, keep us away. Death has been defeated on the cross by Christ our Lord. Amen. The fifth word from the cross, I thirst. Perhaps we think these words from Jesus on the cross all need to be filled with such symbolism, such profound meaning. And perhaps they are. Perhaps when Jesus said he was thirsty, he was speaking of his thirst for, all, for salvation for all people, his longing for justice, his longing for hope for the world, his longing for God's word to be fulfilled through him, his longing for more time to teach and to love and to live. Or perhaps, as the reading says, he's said it to fulfill what the scriptures foretold in the Psalms. Frankly, it's easier for us to look deeply into these words. It's easier to keep searching for great meaning behind these moments than to pause very long and look at Jesus, the man in sheer misery. It's easier to think of him dropping bits of wisdom t to the people looking up at him and with the clarity of mind to speak words that are fulfilling the scriptures rather than acknowledge his body hanging in shreds and muttering words out of human need, even desperation. It's easier to look for depth and great truths in these words from the lips of a savior than to think about Jesus the man bleeding and broken and feeling abandoned and longing for the tiniest bit of comfort a drop of water on a parched tongue someone to care enough to grant some sliver of relief as his life withered away in the Middle Eastern heat can we even bear to see him this heartbroken and this human? Could it be that we cheapen the depth of his sacrifice unless we can pause and really see him now? Really sit here at the foot of the cross and be willing to love him for all he was thinking and feeling and sacrificing, all that is holy and all that is human. From John's Gospel. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. This word of Christ from the cross overlaps with some of the others that we've heard. It's worth noting that this word comes right after Jesus has put his mother and the disciple together into relationship. It's noteworthy that John says, after that happened, Jesus knew that all things were finished and then he asked for he said he was thirsty so that he might fulfill scripture for Jesus taking care of relationships and making sure that they are put in place was more important was a higher priority than fulfilling scripture when Jesus says it is finished he doesn't say well I think I've done a pretty good job here 
I think I've got most of it taken care of. Maybe you all can pick up the rest of the slack and pick up your end of the bargain and take care of things. No, he said it is finished. Jesus obeyed God right to the end. We remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked that he might not have to be on the cross. But he followed that by saying, not my will, but yours, God. He was obedient even to the last, so that God's plan for our forgiveness, for our salvation, for taking care of our sins might be complete. And Jesus didn't just take care of most of our sins on the cross. He said, it is finished. It is done. It is complete. You don't have to worry whether you have had most of your sins cleansed. You don't have to worry whether there are some sins that Jesus just wasn't able to take care of. You don't have to wonder, have I done the right things or said the right things in order to be made right with God? You don't have to wonder, am I a basically good person, so therefore things will be all right in this life and the next. Jesus says, it is finished, and he means it. He didn't say, I think I've done all that I can do. He said, all that needs to be done has been done. You don't need to worry about adding to that. Rest secure in your salvation. Rest secure in knowing that your sins have been forgiven, that God continues to love you no matter what. Hi, I'm Pastor Rod Speedall from Lake Park Lutheran. We're speaking on the seven last words, and the words that I've been given are from Luke 23. The sun had stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. If you're like me, if you were saying, I'm committing my spirit into your hands, you might say it in a soft voice or a whisper. And I'm struck by the fact that Jesus declares it. He says with a loud voice, though his body was broken, his spirit was still strong. There's something else in this Bible passage we need to understand that's deeper and, 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 and more important. That Jesus is saying, no one is taking my life from me. I am giving it up. It says he gave his spirit up to the Father. And this was his human spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Jesus here is suffering in our place, and the Father keeps his spirit until Jesus finishes his work and returns to heaven. These words remind us that Jesus was speaking to the religious leaders about a similar thing. He said, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. I have other sheep of another place, and they must also come. The reason the Father loves me is I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This is the command I receive from my Father. Another aspect we see here is that Jesus is in communication with his Heavenly Father. And this shows that from the very beginning, Jesus' work was one that came out of a community, the community we call Trinity. And that it was meant not just for the Jewish community. Notice, I have other sheep. He lays down his life willingly so that he can give it for the whole world. It is at this point when the temple curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. So the whole idea of Jesus' Jewishness, though it's important, now becomes one of universal significance. And it recalls for me many of the passages where God said, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to all peoples. So Jesus then becomes a blessing for the whole world. And for us, when we think about giving up our spirit, we can entrust our spirit to God the Father and our spirit prospers in his hand. When Jesus says that he gives up the spirit, remember, he has the authority also then to show us how to live and how to die and how to give our spirit willingly up to God the Father who will keep it for all eternity. God bless you.